Okay, are you seeing my screen? Yes, we are. Okay. First, I wanted to say uh, thank you for having me and you know, me as the representative for Rubin Observatory here to talk to you all today. Um, uh, right at the outset, I will say this is the first ever, you know, conference Zoom proceeding I've done. Um, we're still adapting to this new life. So uh, if anything goes awry with my setup, I apologize. Uh, I also apologize if my three-year-old at some point busts into the room and just, you know, makes quite a racket but she's happily entertained right now. So hopefully that won't be an issue. Um, I feel like I had something else I wanted to say, but, um, oh yes, uh, earlier today, for whatever reason, my internet connection was slightly unstable. So if uh, I go out, I promise I'll be right back. I have a ping running in the background right now to let me know if something happens. Okay, so I'm here representing Rubin Observatory, uh, which many people here may or may not have heard of. Uh, and specifically, I'm going to talk about the, the data analysis uh, uh, engine that we've been building uh, to process all the data. Um, as I get started here, I suppose I need to be on the screen. Um, I just wanted to give a, a uh, a nice pretty picture we have of the Rubin Observatory under construction. It's actually a little bit further along than this. You can see all the scaffolding up uh, in the upper um, right hand corner. That's a little bit further along now, but we don't have as quite pretty of a picture since then uh, as they're going into winter down in Chile. Uh, I should mention that this is being built in the Atacama Desert in Chile. I don't think I've put that in any slides. Um, so uh, this is just sort of a an image to keep in mind as I'm talking about things. So what is the Rubin Observatory? Well, we are, uh, we are a facility where, I, I stress facility because uh, there, it's a whole, well, I'm not gonna get into that. There's a little bit of, of uh, naming and various things that's probably common to a lot of different types of projects. Um, but we're a facility, we're gonna conduct a optical and near infrared survey. So the only fundamental particles that we're really concerned with is uh, photons, but uh, a lot of the same sorts of, you know, scientific computing is applicable everywhere. Um, so this survey is going to be called the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, LSST. Prior to our renaming to Rubin Observatory, the whole project was named LSST. Um, and so that's where a little bit of name confusion goes if you go to Google anything. So this survey, we're going to be taking uh, pictures of basically half the, half the night sky. You can see over here on the right hand screen sort of a uh, uh, depiction of the uh, area of the night sky which we'll be taking images. Um, and so this is basically most of the uh, sky that's visible from the Southern Hemisphere at our location. Um, we're going to be doing somewhere between 800 and 1,000 observations per night. So we'll take an image, flew to telescope, take an image, repeat this. Uh, and most of the observations will be repeated 20 to 30 minutes apart, which helps us characterize like variability and stuff. Um, we're going to de detect about 10 million transient events a night. So these are things like uh, moving asteroids, uh, trans Neptunian like comets, supernovas, you know. Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, the sort of thing that you have to be watching in order to catch. Um, and that's one of the, the primary goals of this survey is to, it's called wide fast deep. So we're going to survey a lot of area down to very faint, uh, 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 very faint sources and we are going to do it often so we can catch all these, these events as they happen. Our, pic our camera is the largest, I believe this is still true, um, we are the largest uh, digital camera ever assembled in both terms of number of pixels. We have 3.2 gigapixel camera. And actually in terms of, of volume, our, our camera is about, about the size of like a Volkswagen Beetle. Um, a lot of that comes from the cryostats and stuff like this. Uh, but this, just to put it in perspective, this 3.2 gigapixel pixel camera if you were to display each one of our pixels sort of in a one-to-one -one scale, uh, you would need a basketball, basketball court size uh, 
uh, a basketball court filled with 4K TVs completely layering the entire uh, area in order to display a one-to-one -one pixel. Uh, we, the survey itself is going to generate about 100 petabytes of data over the course of the survey and catalog more or less 40 billion unique objects. Um, again, that's sort of an estimate because we won't know exactly what the universe looks like until we look at it. So who are we? This is the team I'm actually here representing today. This is the data management team. Uh, we began in 2008. This was prior to me, but the team itself began in 2008 with just a handful of people sort of in a, in a prototype funding um, uh, scenario where uh, a lot of the early R&D was done. Uh, we since have transitioned, I think in 2014, right as I was starting the project in the construction phase, that's when all the software and hardware was being built. Um, and today we've grown to uh, about 100 different developers working on this project split over five different institutions that you see below. So as far as our data processing, uh, this is, again, what our, our team is responsible for. Uh, once the survey is operational, we will be doing a nightly processing of all these transient things that I talked about, supernovas, moving asteroids, stuff like that. Uh, and this, this Processing will happen uh, within 60 seconds of every image being taken off the telescope. So we actually have dedicated fiber optic lines running from Chile up to our data centers uh, that will stream the images as they come off the telescope to our data centers. And we have a 60 second window in our, in our sort of funding requirements to do all of our image processing and send out alerts to the rest of the community uh, who will you know, sign up to be alerted for different sorts of events, whether it's a, maybe you care about uh, supernovas and so your telescopes will be set up to look for events and automatically slew or move their telescope to look at particular targets. The second area uh, that we are responsible for is yearly processing. So sort of once a year, we'll take all of the images that have been taken to date and process them all together into a giant catalog of everything we've detected. Um, Today. And, you know, that helps when you're doing things like, you know, stacking multiple images together uh, so you can, uh, you know, increase your signal to noise ratio and get uh, uh, to fainter sources or better characterizations on particular sources. Below, sort of at the bottom here, you'll see a, an image that was processed from sort of a precursor survey, which is called the Hyper Supreme Cam survey, using our data analysis pipeline. So we took data from their survey and process it through um, and produce this image. Uh, one of the fun things to note about this, I don't know how well it'll come across on Zoom, but as you look at this image, you might see, you know, all the little flecks and, you know, you see stars and then you see more colors, more colors, and down way into the background right near the black and you might, you know, your eye, eye might trick you into thinking that, oh, well, there's some noise in there, little flecks and stuff. But in reality, every single thing you see, including what you think is noise in this image, is a separate galaxy. There, there's, we basically cut the threshold so there's no noise in this and everything is a real uh, object. So you're looking somewhere between 200 and 400,000 galaxies right here. So the details of this slide are not particularly important, but uh, it's just to sort of highlight sort of a really high level overview of, of our processing pipeline where we start you know, from raw images and calibration images and sort of reference catalogs for things that have come before us, like the, uh, the Gaia spacecraft mission, if you've heard of that and stuff. We can take prior information, feed it through and do some single frame uh, processing. So that's each individual image. We can combine the images together and go through this high level processing. And out at the end, we produce catalogs of uh, measurements. So for each source, we're responsible for producing a whole set of different measurements, such as like the flux of an object or uh, measuring the given shape of a galaxy. Um, and then scientists will come along and take these catalogs and do further science, science on this. Um, one of the things you might have seen, you know, in popular press, if you've ever seen three-dimensional maps of like dark matter distributions in the universe, that, that sort of stuff comes out of these, these type of uh, survey catalogs. Um, the 
other area where we'll do things. I, I talked about the, the catalogs we're gonna produce, but it, we have so much good data there that we can't possibly do all the science to put into a catalog for everybody to do uh, their, their work on. So we're also en enabling um, astronomers to come by and basically run their own science against our data sets. Uh, however, there's way too much uh, data for us to send all the pixel level data out to everybody who could possibly want it across the world, pretty much. Um, and so we have this uh, thing we call, it our, call our science platform. Uh, and it allows sort of this uh, astronomers to, to write code that will run against our data in our data centers. Uh, using the same tools we use to produce the data to start with. This uh, science platform uses Jupyter Lab. Uh, we do, it's, a, it's all cloud-based, so each user gets a per user containerized environment. Every time you sign on, one of these containers is, is spun up in a, in a Kubernetes cluster, um, and you can choose multiple versions of our software and everything, and you get a, a dedicated uh, uh, node to do your work on. And, you know, it's got various software and data visualizations built right into it. Um, some people here might be familiar with uh, Jupyter Lab and stuff, but for us, this was a really big game changer when it came along, so much so that uh, our team actually worked with the Jupyter Lab people on the fundamental engineering of it when it came along, because before Jupyter Lab was invented, we were really struggling to figure out how we were gonna uh, fulfill this, this mandate we had for enabling science against our data. So our science platform looks something like this. Again, if you've seen uh, Jupyter Lab, this may not be news to you, but if you haven't, you know, you have an environment where you have notebooks, you have a terminal session, our, all of our uh, containers get sort of persistent storage so users can come and go do their analysis. We've got some of our, our customized visualization tools that can work against our databases and stuff built right into these environments. Uh, and so this is a way for, for people to come and do all the science that, you know, we couldn't ever think of doing beforehand. So now we're going to get into Python a little bit, since this is actually a, you know, Python conference. Everything up to now has sort of been a motivation for our, our uh, analysis pipeline. But why do we like Python as a language? Well, we find it's easy to write code that beginners and advanced users you know, have what they need to get their job done. This can be something as simple as, you know, function calls to really advanced metaprogramming to enable all sorts of creative uh, uh, software. We find Python is really great for getting things done quickly. So you can really quickly go from a prototype stage through uh, to, you know, production stage. Sometimes this can have software engineering costs when things scale up. I'll have a bit more to say about this later, but uh, I, I'm sure a lot of people here have, have run into some of these troubles before. Um, a lot of the things, though, that we've uh, run into, uh, Python has started to address. Like I said, our team would, started in about 2008, and it's been really interesting to follow the evolution of Python uh, at the same time we're evolving our software stack. Um, you know, so big Python 2 to 3 transition, and uh, Python is introducing, you know, things like abstract base classes, you now have type annotations, you know, that sort of stuff. And we find that Python is great for bringing together low, uh, code written in lower level languages. So we also make use of C++ in our, uh, in our software stack for sort of the, some of the real fundamental things that you just really need to go fast. Um, and we make our C++ into Python using the PyBind 11 package if you're familiar with it. If you're not, it's a fantastic way to wrap C++ code into Python. It allows you to really uh, create interfaces that feel familiar in C++, but also feel very Pythonic when you're working in Python. So how do we use Python in our workflow? Well, we sort of have a middleware system for uh, storing and in storage indexing and retrieval. Um, so as we get our data, we've got a bunch of uh, uh, properties about each individual image and all all of, and not only when it comes up to telescope, but as you do subsequent uh, processing, you can attach all these, uh, uh, all this information into what we call a registry. And 
the details of this image aren't important, but the idea is you have individual uh, qualities of data that can get put into a registry. Uh, that registry can be sort of used to uniquely identify this stuff. Um, and Python objects can get stored in there and then the storage gets put back in the registry. This abstracts over things like where things are stored. It could be on a POSIX file system. It could be in an S3 storage. You know, all of these things are nicely abstracted away. And it, it decouples knowing about the data from actually using the data, which is a really important thing in our model um, where scientists can just worry about um, writing their scientific algorithm and trust that the data they need will get to them when they need it by just using certain identifiers. And they don't have to care about where it comes from, basically. Uh, we use Python uh, in our configuration system. So we have a declarative uh, schema-based configuration system that tracks sort of what config options are changed, what changed those config options, and when it was changed. So these options can be set from things like the command line, config override files within, within Python itself. Um, you can see an example here on the left. I don't know if this is too small to see on Zoom or not, but it's, it's a, an example of one of our configuration classes. Uh, it's sort of written out as a, as a uh, class-based system where you just have individual fields uh, to declare what you want your options to be. Uh, and there's methods for doing things like validating that your config options are, are correct. And over here on the, on the right, I have a little thing that shows like if you were to use one of these configuration classes, you can just create an instantiation and then set various properties of this. Uh, this actually has been so successful, the configuration system, several other uh, astronomy projects are starting to adopt our configuration system because it's really nice that your configuration lives right alongside your code and is nestable within other configurations. So if something updates, you don't have to worry about updating your code. You basically get it for free. We all, so our actual workflow, we, it's all sort of built around the idea of, of tasks. They're, these are sort of individual atomic operations um, that A, you can nest inside other ones, but they share a common interface. And with this, uh, you can actually uh, do things such as declaring sort of what data set types you would want for inputs and what you will produce as outputs. And this allows us to actually automatically create pipelines from any given task or you know, set of tasks to, to execute. Um, all the ordering and everything is automatically determined uh, by the unique set. Over here on the right, you can kind of see a graph of this. Now this is a, a sort of high level graph. The graph gets much more complicated as each one of these gray nodes gets expanded out into concrete, you know, uh, identify data sets, but the idea is that we can automatically uh, construct any given pipeline from a, a set of tasks. So a task author really gets to be restricted down into just the science they care about and declare what they can handle and what they can produce. Um, this one I didn't have much to say, you know, we have sort of scientific algorithms that are pluggable. So within a given task, you might have, you know, let's say an algorithm to calculate a mean or a median or something like that, you know, and these are all pluggable and interchangeable within a given task. And these uh, measurement algorithms uh, also have runtime ordering within a given task. So tasks are higher level, algorithms are a little bit lower level that are used inside tasks. And, you know, we, throughout the years have produced an extensive, you know, library of primitives, uh, some of which are built in C++, so other astronomers can leverage sort of fast operations, uh, thinking things like coordinate transforms and stuff like that. So what does our code base look like? We've got um, about two thirds of our code is Python, about one third of our code is C++, uh, totaling sort of, you know, 420,000 lines of code. This puts us on order of, of SciPy and NumPy, I believe. 
uh, this is a little bit in flux as we develop and they develop. And I haven't looked at the number strongly for a few years. So that could be a bit out of date, but roughly on the order. And all of our code is split over about 80 packages. And I'll get into a little bit about why that is uh, later. Uh, it's, it, it mainly is due to our development process. So how does our code base look through time? So this is a plot of sort of the number of lines of code over the years going back to 2013. Uh, we don't really, we didn't really have access to our old SVN repositories from prior to 2013. They lived somewhere and then died a long time ago. Um, and that was before we sort of were more formal than we are now, let's say. Um, and we've actually migrated through a lot of different technologies throughout the years. Um, but I'm proud to say that recently our number of lines of codes that correspond to Python comments, so these are comments and you know documentation strings and stuff like that, has recently eclipsed our number of lines of C++ uh, algorithm code, uh, which is an interesting statistic. I'm also proud to show that the this blue trend line, which is the number of Python lines of code, and this orange line are basically trending with each other. So we're doing pretty good about writing uh, documentation for our code as we go. So what does our development process look like? Um, all of our work is managed through a ticketing system. We use uh, JIRA for this, if you're familiar with that. If you're not, it's just a system for producing tickets to track work. Um, any developer can create tickets. So any developer can go off and say, like, I want to work on this particular thing, or I found a bug and I, uh, I'm going to fix it. So uh, any developer is sort of empowered to do what they feel is right, with the caveat that for larger changes that may affect multiple parties or change some fundamental behavior, uh, we have a system for uh, discussion called uh, requests for comments. This is mirrored on the early internet days where RFCs were used to set policy and it's worked it worked well for them and it's worked well for us so far. Um, and it kind of democratizes things a bit and everybody gets a chance to feel like they're being heard. Our code is tracked with Git now. I mentioned SVN back in the day, but all of our code is now tracked with Git. Uh, and all the work done is done on ticket branches. So this is a branch associated with whatever ticket number um, that you uh, got when you created a ticket to work on something. Our code reviews are done on GitHub. Um, that's fairly common these days. Our merges are done with no fast forward, which is not quite as common these days. Most people tend to squash commits um, and just have uh, uh, one large you know, master repository. Uh, also, all of the individual commits are squashed to sort of functioning logical units of work. So our philosophy is as much as possible, we'd like to be able to bisect arrive at a place in Git history and have that a working state of our pipeline. Uh, so there's no like two or three commits in a row that if you ended up on one, nothing would work. And so what does this look like? So our Git on the left, you'll see sort of a, a Git uh, log of another open source Python package. And you can see sort of the, the normal uh, or the more common way of development that you'll see with you have various commits done on various tickets and they get intermer uh, uh, intermixed with each other. And it becomes a little bit harder to track what came from what ticket. And, uh, and when things get inter intermingled, you can end up in sort of broken states. On the right is how we do things um, where we have our master branch is one continuous line of history with each individual uh, branch in that history corresponding to a single ticket. And before anything gets merged to master, it gets rebased on to uh, master so that when it gets merged in, again, you get this single flow of history that is readable to a human to understand what is going on. And that's why it's important for us to have uh, merges with no fast forward because it lets us know sort of delimitators between this work came from this ticket and this work came from this ticket. Through our development process, uh, we use a style guide uh, for uniformity in both code and Git practices. So we have a coding standard, which uh, is, is not uncommon. 
Uh, so we try and make it so that if you read the code, there's no distinctive style for any individual programmer. But this is the same for Git practices. Um, so commit messages, bodies, um, that sort of thing. The style guide, though, it is itself just another repository. So anybody can propose changes to it and uh, create requests for comments and stuff like that and update the style guide as we go. And this has been particularly useful um, as you know Python has changed and we've been changing with it. We use Travis and Jenkins for our unit and integration tests. And if anybody is interested in sort of what our guidelines look like, so we have you know, Python and C++ style guides and stuff. You can find all that information at developer.lss2.io. I wanted to take a few minutes to sort of communicate some lessons and, and musings that we've learned over the years working with uh, uh, Python to put together a large pipeline like this. Like I said, we've been working sort of continuously on the same project since 2008. Um, so some of these may be applicable to you and some of them may not be, but here's some of the things we learned. We now try and make our objects at least conceptually immutable whenever we can. So in Python, everything is shared, right? You, you pass around and you're essentially passing around a reference. And in a big complex system, this is, uh, it's likely that somebody else owns a variable somewhere and if you have a lot of mutations of state, it can be hard to track down uh, unexpected behavior. Um, and I say conceptually immutable because in Python, it's basically impossible to make everything truly immutable. But if you code in such a way that uh, in such a way that you don't own something, it becomes a little bit easier. Uh, we now try and use interfaces that are separate from implementations everywhere. So this would be, for instance, using abstract base classes. Um, in Python, it's really, really easy to program in Python and get a working prototype up and going. But that working prototype can quickly become uh, the de facto design, uh, even if it wasn't intended to be. And these sorts of things make refactoring very difficult much later on. And we've gone through major refactors several times in our history. Uh, and the other big one, which may not apply to everybody, depending on how complex your packages are, uh, try to organize your code in according to dependencies. So what code imports what other code? Not necessarily related ideas. It's always uh, attractive to stick a function or a method or something lower level in some package stack because, hey, then it's shared amongst more people. Uh, but it can quickly turn into a situation where you are uh, doing cyclical imports and that becomes messy for pa packaging. Uh, packaging CI and build systems always take more time than you think you should allow for that. Um, documentation, everybody likes documentation, but if your community just doesn't have the culture around it, it's hard to get people to write good docs. The big, biggest one that we uh, get hit with all the time is documentation bit rots faster than code. So in code, you can have unit tests and this and that, but your documentation will bit rot. And this is often, at least for us, a side effect of doing um, code reviews on GitHub. So the GitHub diffs don't always show relevant documentation lines. So a reviewer wouldn't know to go read you know, documentation that talks about uh, about a particular change and say, hey, you should go update this. Uh, and we've also find linters and the like have really saved us a lot of time catching bit rot, you know, helps to enforce standards and stuff. And more recently, um, some of us have started using the static analysis tools um, with like MyPy and stuff, which are sort of uh, linters plus plus as it were. Um, and it looks like I'm about right on time. Uh, my sort of wrap up to this is uh, we've continued to grow alongside the tools we use. Uh, our goals are to create a welcoming community environment for everyone. Uh, so all of our software is open source in GPL version three. Uh, we develop in the open. Anybody can go look at our repositories at any time. Uh, but not only is our, our code open source as far as algorithms and stuff, this openness includes our infrastructure too. So the team that developed it, like our software platform and how that's deployed and how all uh, users can get their own images and stuff, that's all actually 
decoupled from our individual science. So anybody can come along and create their own uh, science platform to do whatever they'd like. Uh, so we welcome feedback and collaboration. And I will be hanging around on, you know, I'm going to answer questions here in a moment, but I will be on Slack for the next few days. But uh, if there's other interest in asking questions and stuff, we've got a, a uh, page at community.lsst.org, which is sort of like our Stack Overflow. And you can go to the section under data management and create an issue and ask questions. You can mention me with that at Nate Lust if you want to direct something towards me. But in general, if you say, hey, I'd like to know more about this thing, it's, it's a good place to get uh, feedback. And with that, I will call it close. Well, Nate, thanks, thanks very much. That was uh, a really excellent talk. So, um, so yeah, I think we're all very impressed. And I really have liked the your lessons and musing slides a lot. Um, so what we're going to do is, if I can actually, uh, I'm going to send to you over chat uh, a view of the questions. And then uh, maybe you could just click that and share that so everyone could see the questions that are up on screen. And then we can just kind of walk through uh, a few of them at a time. Sure. Um, so I, I sent that on the Zoom chat. Sure, I just need to figure out where. <laughs> sure, yeah. That is, OK, here we go. So. Let me stop sharing this screen. Start sharing. This screen. Yeah, okay. Great. Okay. So the first question we have from Ulrich is that Jupyter notebooks uh, from users tend to become very long single function implementations. So do you do anything to help users in preventing this? So this is actually one of my big pet peeves. I'm not a big Jupyter notebook fan. I think they're great for, you know, learnings and demonstrations and stuff. But as you say, or the question says, they can get very complicated. Um, we try and provide as much library, uh, you know, library support as we can. So you can do much of your work without needing to reinvent the wheel but there's really not much that we can do for individual users. Um, our science platform is actually mandated so that theoretically every American citizen and Chilean citizen and any other country that is participating in the collaboration gets access to this. So theoretically we have to have capacity. I think we're stated for, you know, a million simultaneous users or something. So helping to police individual uh, people is sort of outside our, our, um, outside our ability. But yeah. that said, we do have the LSST community page that I pointed you to to ask questions where we're hoping that people will ask their questions sort of in the open. So if it gets answered once, it's searchable in search engines. And uh, once users become proficient, they can start answering other users' questions sort of in a Stack Overflow style. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like it's built off of like the discourse engine yeah. model or something, right? Yeah. Yep. All right, thanks. Uh, all right, and then we also have another question from Ben. Uh, uh, oops, that, got, that went away someplace. Um, I'm not sure. All right, so Ben's question disappeared. I'm not sure how or why. Um, so. Um, and oh, okay, there we go back again. Thanks, Ben. Uh, all right, so I'm curious how much of the development behind what you described today was done by trained software engineers and computer scientists as opposed to physicists? I think, in terms of you know, job descriptions, we only employ two people who are uh software engineers, you know, that come from that training and that background, however. The project itself is its own selection function, such that we tend to attract the people who did, uh, who were as interested in software development as the science going through, you know, grad school and their careers. And we've tend to soak up quite a lot of those people into our project from the astronomy community. 
And uh, A, that's paid sort of dividends in terms of all of us being able to work together really well. Um, but it has also actually made it a little bit hard to attract people to work on it. Um, as I'm sure is uh, common in your field too, in order to advance in your career, you sort of have to publish a lot. And for us working on this uh, project, you end up becoming more, again, software engineer, uh, scientific software engineers rather than um, publishing scientists. We do you know, publish our work here or there. But it tends to discourage people who are looking for tenure track positions from, from joining our teams because you just don't get much publication. Um, so in that way, the selection function attracts the people who are more interested in doing this kind of work than you know, publishing science. If I can take my chair powers and riff on that question a little bit, do you have personal views on how um, citation of software and things like the Journal of Open Source Software or just even getting a DOI from Zenodo and having experiments explicitly cite the software they use? Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on how that could uh, help people in their careers? Yeah, so it's a thorny issue that I know a lot of people are dealing with. Um, and it's actually multi, multi-stage or multi-layered too, right? Because someone or a small team of two or three people might be able to turn out a few different software packages um, and get various DOIs that people will cite in their work. And that becomes a little bit easier to show, hey, you know, I've done relevant work and stuff. For something like the scale of our project, you know, we get what, one, maybe one or two DOIs for a hundred different people. And yeah, you get a lot of, citations on it, but it's hard to track back to any individual, you know, user. And then so that case, our, our group, it's still pretty hard to do that. Um, how to solve this problem is really, really up in the air. One of the things that the astronomy community has tried to do is we created a, a, an institution. I mean, there's several different things, but um, an institution was created to sort of perpetually employ people who like doing this thing. So as one project ramps down, they can stay employed and then, and then work on software development as the next project ramps up. So as to you know, provide a more stable system um, and people don't have to flee off to industry jobs possibly to never come back. But the middle ground of people who wanna do soft, some of this type of software engineering and publish and potentially get you know, research jobs, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I'm just glad I'm not the one in charge of solving it. Yeah, that's very fair. <laughs> uh, so I think we have time for one final question, which will be uh, Jim's, which is uh, how much are your users, or how much, how much are, uh, are your users of the tools uh, mentioned, such as JupyterLab and PyBind11, and how much uh, feedback or, um, and collaborating with the developers of those tools has happened? Oh yeah, so we've actually collaborated with a lot of different projects as, as we've been doing this over the years. Um, this includes, uh, again, the JupyterLab system, like I said, our, our, our team that is responsible for engineering this stuff off in Tucson, actually worked with them from the ground up as Jupyter Lab was being created to, to make sure it ran well and we're in contact with them frequently. Uh, PyBind 11, we've sent probably, you know, a dozen or more patches back upstream for various issues we've run into. Um, and this kind of goes across the board. There's some things in, in PEP 8 that are now clarified because, you know, we talked to the Python developers to, to get, you know, sort of official rulings from Guido, as it were, on how things should be. And uh, w we really worked very hard to try and uh, keep uh, as much uh, flowing back upstream as we can. And recently, this is uh, coming more to a head as we've been pushing all of the lower level dependencies that we can um, that don't change very much from our stack up onto Conda Forge. So anybody can just more easily build and install them separate from any tool that we might develop. Cool. That, that's also really good to know that uh, that you're kind of forge contributors. That's that's excellent. Um, 
Okay, well, thanks very much for this excellent keynote. I think we are at time, 